Debbie and I are thrilled to be here. It's, it's really great to feel like we have a, a church home. We've been serving a church that's uh, great, but it's three hours away. And uh, we live here in Atlantic Beach, and, and we feel like God is just moving us to, you know, really just kind of be part of a church body and be able to serve here more locally. And so we're, we're thrilled, you know, for that opportunity and look forward to getting to know you all uh, much better. Um, so our, our scripture this morning is, is uh, as was read from Galatians 2, uh, first 10 verses. And, you know, David has done a wonderful job these last two uh, Sundays, you know, introducing us to the book of Galatians and, uh, you know, the, the theme of uh, the, the true gospel, the pure gospel, the gospel to which nothing is added. Um, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And, um, you know, in, in keeping with that, Paul Paul is continuing to, to focus on that specific thing that there's nothing added. In fact, I'd say a, sort of a key verse, if I was going to give this a title, it'd be from verse 6, uh, adding nothing. And that's, that's what uh, Paul said happened when he went to Jerusalem to meet with the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, Paul, you know, was uh, converted independently of the church. Jesus spoke to him directly from heaven and, and met him on the road to Damascus, and, and Jesus himself gave Paul the gospel. And uh, Paul had been preaching the gospel, and people had been getting converted in the Gentile world. But some of the disciples of the apostles, not the apostles, but some of their disciples misled, and they were showing up to Paul's churches and saying, you know, hey, this Paul's a pretty good guy, but he's, he's not a Jew I mean, he's a, he's a Jew, but he's forgetting, you know, his connection to the Jewish church, and, um, you know, he's missing something. <clears throat> it's important for you to, of course, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and that's why you're going to heaven, but it's also important for you to remember the Old Testament ceremonies that, that our fathers have been care, careful to preserve for 2,000 years, and uh, so you need to add that. And specifically, that's why this word circumcision comes up. It, it's, it's symbolic of all the Old Testament law that the Jews were very careful to keep. So this is the question. Paul comes now to Jerusalem. The Lord gave him a revelation, said, I want you to go to Jerusalem. And uh, the whole church needs to know that you guys are on the same page. There are not two different groups. Paul's not starting a new splinter denomination of the Christian church already. Uh, but we're all one. And so Paul goes to Jerusalem, and Paul says, you know, I, I was wanted to make sure I hadn't been wasting my time preaching in vain. Paul wasn't, he's, he wasn't concerned that his gospel was the right one because Jesus had given it to him directly himself, but he was concerned these rumors he was hearing that the apostles were, were adding something to the gospel. And uh, he thought that probably couldn't be true, but he said, I, the Lord told me to go and just make sure that you know, all of us are on the same page here. So he got to Jerusalem, and he specifically took Titus with him, who was not circumcised, because he wanted not just words, but he wanted to see that these uh, leaders in the church in Jerusalem would welcome and give the right hand of fellowship to Titus, an uncircumcised uh, believer uh, who was not a Jew. <clears throat> and so that's what's, that's, the that's what's going on here. And Paul said, and I was thrilled to get there and to talk to Peter and James and the, you know, the, the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, and they added nothing to my gospel. They added nothing. Now, for some reason or other, and I think we can sort of explore a little bit why, but there's something in the hearts of all of us that feels like well, surely we must add something. You know, back in the 50s, I, um, how many of you can remember when instant cakes became a thing? Can you, a few of you can remember that? Uh, I can sort of remember in the 50s. I can remember some of the 50s. And uh, uh, Betty Crocker, you know, a brand of General Mills, had a, had a cake mix that you, literally all you had to do is add water. Well, but it was just water. And, and you know what happened? Nobody bought it. People thought, no, nah, this can't be true. 
this can't be as good as my scratch chocolate cake. And they had a hard time selling it. In fact, all the cake companies were doing the same thing, and they just weren't selling. And General, General Mills brought in some psychologists to analyze what in the world is going on. This is so easy, and these cakes are so good, and we do blind cake tests, and people can't tell the difference, but nobody's buying them. And you know what these psychologists decided? You need to take the dried egg out. You need to, put a, you need to tell them to put an egg in. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it took off. It, it took off. Well, here's the deal. If you were a, if you were a housewife in the 50s, was, was instant cake a good thing for you or was it a bad thing for you? Well, it all depends on how good a cook you were. <laughs> if you showed up at the church potluck and your badge of honor was your chocolate cake that nobody else could duplicate, that wasn't particularly a good day for you. <laughs> but if you didn't spend much time in the kitchen and it wasn't your forte, this was wonderful. <laughs> and you could fib a little and tell people it was scratch because you put an egg in. <laughs> <laughs> After all, nobody ground the flour. Everybody cheated a little bit. <laughs> But my friends, that's exactly a picture of the church. There are, there are people coming into the church who are so glad that there's nothing they have to add because they know they've got nothing they can add. But people who have been around church for a long time and studied the Bible and developed their prayer life and learned the language, the prayer language of the church, it's hard to sit side by side with no distinction between the newcomers who just showed up or to sit next to the alcoholic or to sit next to the lady who just had an affair. It's hard to feel like we want to be equal at the foot of the cross if we've worked so hard to do it right. Well, my friends, uh, Paul says, if the gospel's the gospel, there's nothing you can add to make yourself worthy and acceptable to God. Nothing. Now, Luther, in his preface to Galatians, has got a wonderful, um, wouldn't you want to be known just for the preface you wrote to a book someday? <laughs> I mean, but his preface to the book of Galatians, he, he explains what he calls passive righteousness. And he says, the righteousness that makes ex acceptable to God is not, the, is not the right living that we all strive for. It's not whether you obey uh, traffic laws and, and whether you... Uh, never steal or lie. That's not the righteousness that makes you acceptable to God. The only righteousness that makes us acceptable to God is what he calls the passive righteousness, Christ's righteousness that we receive as a gift. He said this righteousness is perfect. It's finished. It's complete. There's not anything we can add to the righteousness of Christ. How do you get it? Well, you don't make yourself worthy for it. You receive it as a gift, he said, as the ground receives the rain. That's how we receive the righteousness of Christ. That's why he calls it a passive righteousness. You literally do nothing to earn it or to make yourself worthy before or after you received it. And this is what Paul believed. That's why he says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, he said, he said, if if the righteousness could be gained through the law, that is through your performing, your obeying, your complying to Christian standards, if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. And my friends, this is what the whole book is about. Receiving the righteousness of Christ as your only standing before God, a righteousness you can never improve on, no matter how long you try to live a good Christian life. So my friends, uh, that's what's 
the backstory here. That's what the big picture is. Now, what about this thing on circumcision? This is the first time in the book that he introduces the term, and it's used very frequently now throughout the rest of the book because it's a code word. His, his Jewish audience and, and the Gentiles who were being looked down upon by the Jews, they understood what he meant. Circumcision is, it stands for all the, the Jewish law, all these ceremonies and all these sacrifices and all these uh, things that had been so important to the Jewish culture and tradition for 2,000 years. And uh, th that was the issue they were making. Like, surely these Christians must need to be circumcised or they can't be well, some, some said they can't be saved. But others were saying, no, they, they probably can get to heaven. But they're not really living in full obedience. They're really, they're really not uh, full Christians until they've completed everything that God requires to be accepted in the body of Christ. So this was a big deal. This is why in Ephesians 2... Um, Paul talks about the barrier wall that, that separated the Gentile believers from the, from the Jewish believers. He said Christ came to abolish the barrier wall. The barrier wall was a, was a literal wall in, in Jerusalem at the temple. There, it was called the wall of the Gentiles. Gentile believers who were not uh, fully Jews could come and worship at the temple, but they had to stay on the outside of the barrier wall, the, the wall of the Gentiles. The Jewish believers could go on the inside of the wall. So they literally were insiders and outsiders. And Paul said, no. Christ came to abolish the barrier wall. In Hebrews, you know that familiar verse, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Uh, the word for assembling in, in Hebrew is, is synagogue, synagogue. Uh, but he uses the word episynagogue, which means the added-on-to synagogue. He's talking about the mixed body of believers, Jew and Gentile. And when he says, do not forsake the assembly, episynagogue, he's saying, we must not separate ourselves from one another when we come to worship. There are not insiders and outsiders anymore. If you're in Christ, you're insider. Period. Now that's that's why this word circumcision uh, from it's a code word. If you don't understand that, you won't understand what he's saying in most of the book. It represents what you must what what you instinctively feel you must add to the gospel to make yourself presentable and worthy. Okay. Now to make this real relevant, this is so relevant. I used to think that Galatians was a great book, but it, it was just for people who thought you got to heaven by good works. I didn't understand that it's the most relevant book in the Bible for me because I'm one of those Christians who's been a Christian my whole life and has worked very hard to be a good Christian and was ready to accept anybody who wanted to come to Christ but felt like my job as a pastor was to be a little holier and a little better than everybody else in the church. I thought that was my job. Can you imagine what that does to your heart as a pastor after years of people actually thinking that too? It's pretty deadly. It's devastating. And it's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. Paul says in Galatians 5 verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Okay? So for this to get, you know, to get relevant for you, what does circumcision mean to you? It's whatever makes you feel special. It's whatever makes you feel like, yeah, we're all brothers and sisters, but not everybody has what I have. Uh, for some people, it's now this gets really, really petty, okay? But for some of us, it's how how clean do we feel like our house is? Um, for some of us, it's how responsible are people? 
Do, does everybody remember to turn the lights out when they leave the room? Does everybody remember to fill your gas tank before you go out? Or do you sometimes run out of gas? I had a friend who moved from Chicago. When we were in Chicago, they moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And they said, oh my gosh, if you bounce a check in Michigan. Now, you shouldn't bounce checks. But truth be told, we've bounced a few. Even when, when we, we just weren't paying attention. Now, is that a good thing? No, it's not. It's embarrassing. It's wrong. It's, but are we going to divide ourselves between those who bounce checks and those who don't bounce checks? Are we going to divide ourselves between those who remember to turn the lights out and don't? I have a thing about making sure the doors are all locked at night. You know, and I, sometimes I, I mean, we, we judge even the people we love. You know, we kind of think that the people who live in our own home are, are you know, what, what, what kind of person doesn't check the doors at night? Now I got a granddaughter living with us who's better at that than I am, so I can relax a little, you know? She's righteous. <laughs> But are, but are you a person who always needs to be on time? If you're not early, you're late. Well, that's great. I'm glad that works for you. It, it's nice to be on time. It's respectful. But, you know, there are cultures in the... I've preached at churches where I didn't have any clue what time we were going to start. <laughs> I had no clue. You know, in fact, our, our church in Orlando that we started... Um, I could never in 20 years get those people to start on time. And you couldn't get them to leave after. <laughs> but my poor wife, you know, that's not her forte. And uh, we didn't know she had ADD. And, and, but even if she's on time, people would stop her, you know, in the parking lot. Everybody wanted to talk to her as soon as she showed up. And she's surrounded by people who wanted to get her ear and talk to her. And you know what? People were actually more important to her than being on time. And I was the idiot who th made her feel like dirt. You know, she, she gets there with four kids she's got to dress and feed and prepare dinner for whoever we're going to bring home after church. And, and uh, you see how ugly this can get? I mean, we all have something. What is it for you? Is it cleanliness? Is it how smart you are? Is it how responsible you are? It can be how humble you feel. You can be thankful that you're not one of those arrogant guys that talks about himself all the time. You can be really proud of your humility. You see how subtle this is, how deadly this is? I'll give you one, mask or no mask. I mean, Debbie and I tried to go to another church a few weeks ago just because we wanted, I mean, we weren't leaving this church. We just wanted to be part of a live, you know what I mean? And we wore our mask because we're, you know, we want to be careful. And um, we had a hard time finding a place. And we'd, we'd pick a spot. It was a big auditorium, you know, and we'd find a spot where there weren't any people without masks around us, you know, and pretty soon somebody come in and sit right behind us without a mask on and we'd have to, we'd move. We moved about three or four times and we said, oh, forget it. Let's just go home. And, you know, we were a little judgmental to the people who showed up with no mask. Like, what? Don't they respect? But I, mean, I imagine they're thinking, don't those people have any faith at all? <laughs> don't they trust Jesus? You, you see how this can work? Anything can become a barrier wall. You know, our, our theology can become a barrier wall. Are we Reformed Christians? Are we, we Arminian? We stress free will over God's sovereignty? Do we baptize babies? Do we just baptize adults? How about our style of worship? Anything can become a barrier wall in the, in the body of Christ. Right? And Paul says it's ugly. Paul actually refers to, you know, in, in chapter 2, verse 10, uh, verse 12, these other, these other people, he calls them the circumcision group. <laughs> it was a group who thought they were the insiders. You see, there are groups in church, and we're all great. Yeah, let's all be brothers and sisters in Christ, but there's that deep, deep need in our hearts, our, our fallen nature 
to find some distinction that sets us apart. See, you know what it is? It's pride. C.S. Lewis says the pride is the only sin that is essentially competitive. Pride is not wanting to be the best you can be. Pride is I need to be better than somebody else. See how ugly that is? That's, that's one of the reasons this is so important to Paul. He says, no, the church will never love well if they don't understand that we can add nothing to the gospel. Nothing. Now somebody, I, I know somebody's thinking, well, what about obedience? Doesn't obedience count? Yes, God loves, I mean, he, of course we should strive for obedience because that's how we love God and that's how we love people. But Paul said, whether you just had the worst Saturday night of your life and you are so ashamed, you, you can't even hold your head up when you, when you come into church the next morning. Or whether you had a great week, you had your quiet time every day this week, and you talked to three people about Jesus, and you can't wait to get to church. Paul said, when we get here, we're equal. In the eyes of God, the righteousness we bring to the Lord's table is exactly the same righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's all we ever have and it's all we ever need. Amen. See? Now, it can be your grades, it can be your trophies, it can be your, like I said, your, your cleanliness, your mask, your no mask. But essentially, <clears throat> Paul said, when you're focusing on the thing that you've added to the gospel to make you feel worthy, to make you feel special, you're not going to be able to love people. We can't have a first class section and a second in a, in a you know coach class without the people and coach feeling really bad about themselves. It's just it's just no way to do it. J J D Salinger has this you know indicting quote. It's so true, and it's just hard to escape it. He says, there's no difference that I can see between the man who's greedy for material treasure or even intellectual treasure and the man who's greedy for spiritual treasure. As you say, treasure's treasure. And it seems to me that 90% that of the world-hating saints in history were just as acquisitive and unattractive, basically, as the rest of us. This is a non-Christian saying, yeah, I know I'm a mess. But all these godly people I know are, seem just as mean-spirited as any of the rest of us. My friends, I'm afraid it's true. Sometimes people get harder to live with when they become Christians. Oh, they're okay at first. At first, they're full of the joy of the Lord because they've got nothing but the gospel. But, you know, after working at it for 10 or 20 years, they begin to feel, you know, we all fall into this. Well, I've done a few things right, you know. And as soon as you feel that, my friends, we've lost the gospel. Now, now here's the question in Paul's mind is not just how do we get to heaven. Um, I used to think that's all this was about in Galatians, but it's not. It's bigger than that. It's what makes you pleasing to God? What makes you huggable? What makes you huggable to God? Oh, we know it's going to take pity on our poor, poor, this, our poor sinners because of Jesus dying on the cross. But can he turn his face toward me? Can his face light up when I walk into the room? Paul says, yes. No matter who you are, no matter how far you've fallen, when you come to Jesus, you are fully received in the beloved you are received, and he says in the book, as a, as a son and a daughter, not a slave. A son or a daughter. Um, you now, let's be honest, parents. We're not, we're not God. We're human fathers, and we're human mothers. Sometimes our kids feel more huggable than at other times. <laughs> right? We're not supposed to say that, but can we be real? It's not true for God our Father. It's not true for Him. Because the only righteousness He's ever looking at is the righteousness of Christ. 
That's what makes you not just freed of your sin to go to heaven one day. That's what makes you huggable. My friend Steve Brown says, you know, you can hug a dirty kid, but you can't hug a stiff kid. What makes us stiff? It's our self-righteousness. We're so uptight. We're so careful. We're so diligent to be responsible Christians. And we make ourselves unhuggable. It's not that God doesn't want to hug us. We're, we can't be hugged. Dirty kids, you can hug them all day. They may be dirty, but they're huggable. They'll just melt into your arms. My friends, that's what God wants for us. He wants us to be huggable Christians. That's the only thing that will make us nice Christians. You know, loving Christians. Now, just as we close this, I want you to think for a second. What, What was Jesus' circumcision like? You know, Jesus came to fulfill all the law, so Jesus was circumcised. You know, circumcision, like all the Old Testament sacrifice, pointed to him. All this, you know, killing of goats and bulls and even even circumcision, which is, you know, just a, a, a little cut, but it, there's blood. And uh, it represents the blood of Christ. And when Christ came, he was circumcised. It says on the eighth day, uh, Mary and Joseph had him circumcised, and that's where they gave him his name, Jesus. What does Jesus mean? Yahweh saves. Now, how much did they understand about what it was going to cost their son to save the world? We don't know. But they knew something. Well, I wonder what it was like for them. You know, I didn't, when we had our son circumcised, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be there. The doctor, hey, do you want to come? I, no, I think I'll take a pass on that. I, I really didn't want to watch. You know, because it's not terrible, but it's painful, I'm sure. It's all, you know, not something pleasant for your little newborn baby to go through. I wonder what it was like for Mary and Joseph to watch their son circumcised, realizing that, okay, this is, there's blood here. I wonder what's coming for our boy. I wonder what's coming. All these, all these slain bulls and goats that's supposed to point to our son, the Messiah, what what does that mean for his future? I'm not sure how much Mary and Joseph understood about that, but I know what God the Father understood. God the Father was thrilled that his son was coming to save the world, to fulfill all the law. But can you imagine the simultaneous joy and pain in his heart when he knew exactly what the blood of this circumcision pointed to. It was a precursor to the cross where he would have to watch his son slain for the sins of the world. Murdered. He would have to turn his back on his boy so that he would never have to turn his back on you and me. My friends, this is the gospel. This is the only gospel. This is... Why would you add anything to this? What could you add to this? Thanks, thanks be to God. It's all finished. Amen. Amen.